you're constantly trying to judge does this sound too much like a computer and not enough like a human being versus when I put all of these elements together in one mix um, are the various small inaccuracies going to add up to a bigger problem. On the 46th episode of Passion in Progress, audio engineer John Douglas. John specializes in drum production, drum editing, drum cleanup, and also producing and editing vocals, mainly around the genre of metal. At any given time, John is working on four to five different projects for clients all across the country. John and I used to work together as audio engineers, but if you listen to John, he is such a perfectionist about audio in a good way. So if you're just the casual listener to this podcast, be prepared for a very nerdy conversation surrounding audio. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank all of my patrons on Patreon that have supported me thus far on these 46 episodes of the Passion in Progress show. Thank you so much. If you would like to become a patron of the show and support me in what I'm doing, I'm on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Javier Mercedes. Also, don't forget to share this content out. If you find it valuable on any of the social platforms, you can tag me at Javier Mercedes X. That's J-A-V-I-E-R-M-E-R-C-E-D-E-S with an X on the end. Let's go ahead and get into the 46th episode of Passion in Progress with audio engineer John Douglas. What is up, Mercedes and Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show, where we talk to inspiring individuals, and hopefully through hearing their story, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. And today I am in Atlanta, Georgia, in one of the most bestest, awesomest, interestingest, any other istest that has to do with recording in a home studio. This is like way beyond home studio. Um, the, so the equipment that we're co- recording on right now is my equipment, but we are surrounded by other things that could make this equipment sound so much better. <laughs> I am here with audio engineer, audio producer, all of the things that have to do with audio. John Douglas, thank you so much, man. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for that intro. That was that was very <laughs> nice. Uh, I, I posted an Instagram post and it was it was just like me singing in here. And somebody was like, oh, is that, that's cool. Is that, is that a home studio? I'm like, well, it's in my home. <laughs> it's definitely a studio. So, yeah, I guess. <laughs> right before we started recording, we recorded or we filmed a little tour of his place. And the place that we're in right now is a room that is the control room. And to our right or his left is a completely different live room for drums. And I'm assuming we are going to get into your specialty there. But uh, to give the listeners that are just uh, consuming this podcast via their ears, it's an amazing space. And there's a it's it goes way beyond what you would think a home studio like there's acoustic paneling there's outboard gear everywhere anything that you would want to be uh in a creative space it's here like you can just walk in and start creating music it's beautiful that's yeah that's kind of the idea and and i think having it look like a real studio is is a major thing if you want to bring if you want to get clients and you uh you have that moment where you bring them in the room for the first time and you want you want to wow them and it's um, sometimes you got to you got to drop some money on on the fancy lights and whatnot to to really sell it. Um, but yeah, like the acoustic paneling stuff, that's that's something that I think a lot more it's people practical. should do. <laughs> and yeah, no, this, this, this is kind of like uh, the, the meeting of DIY and, and professional. Oh, it's so true. You just summed it up to a T right there. For the listeners, go ahead and give a background of what you do on a day-to-day basis now here. It is is a pretty even mixture of of preparing recordings and editing recordings for other people to mix, as well as um, kind of being their virtual assistant for other producers, as well as uh, doing full productions here and uh, bringing bands in, um, flying out and and doing productions with other people in other places. My day-to-day is just staying here, probably working 50% remotely via email and and whatever digital channels and half meeting up with people and and recording stuff. Yeah, can you give the specifics of like the kind of genres of music that you're that you're dealing with? Sure. I have always been into more um aggressive 
uh, styles of music. So in in high school, it was it was punk, and then that kind of evolved into metal. And um, I I found my niche sort of in the more extreme uh, metal stuff, partially by chance, just because of the people I knew. But in order to be able to work on metal productions, you have to know there's a baseline of knowledge that you have to know about what what metal records are supposed to sound like. Um, whereas, you know, when we were working at Doppler for the listeners that don't know, John and I used to work together as audio engineers at a recording studio here. One of the most premier recording studios yeah. in Atlanta, people, Doppler studios, people still talk about it. Like I have, uh, somebody who is working with, uh, with exit and usher currently was, was in LA was telling me that they all they do is talk about stories about Doppler there back in the go, day, yeah. um, and it's still party, party time twenty four seven. When we were working together at Doppler, and uh, there there was like a house drum kit that that some people would use. Occasionally, you, you'd have a, a drummer come in for for something, and you, you mic up the kit using you know four twenty ones on the toms, and you got your your standard kit set up and regardless of what genre it is it's probably going to work more or less mm -hmm. the the metal drumming stuff is a little more specialized it's it's hard to explain some of like why it takes so long to to work on some of these tracks like even just from the very beginning of of setting up to being able to hit record usually it's not the kind of thing that we do in a day usually setup itself is at least a day uh, or two, and then the editing process is usually much more involved than you would have on uh, your average recording where you might just comp some takes and then make a couple edits. If you listen through and see if anything sounds wrong and then fix those things, whereas everything has to be dead on the grid or, or pretty close to it. Uh, otherwise, everything is just going to sound like a mess. I think a good term would be mathematical. It, it's a struggle because it's a you're constantly trying to judge does this sound too much like a computer and not enough like a human being versus when i put all of these elements together in one mix um are the various small inaccuracies going to add up to a bigger problem I, I think you could extrapolate that you could see that in in pop productions Two, it's just my exposure to it first was in the metal stuff where everything is just kind of quantized. But thinking about like the, the modern state of productions in any, any genre, like a lot of stuff is very much to the grid quantized. Uh, maybe it's not as evident because people are dealing with virtual instruments more or and everything just by default. If you're using a drum machine, it's just to the grid by default. Whereas this, you'll have a drummer come in with this very elaborate midi drum performance that he and the guitarist have like created over however many months of of work and his goal is to try and perform that as closely to what they've written as possible for those that don't understand midi is all computerized it's been yeah. it's been plugged into the computer and it's all being played back via the computer but if you want to have an acoustic performance continue it's just little notes that say what to play what drum at what time mm -hmm. and um so they're taking that as more or less as sheet music and and some drummer drummers even hang the sheet music in front of them and try to sight read through the stuff then you go back in the computer and quantize it so that it's even more like that original digital performance mm -hmm. so it's constantly kind of shifting between robotic and human and then mm -hmm. after you've edited the whole thing i'll go through and take all the close mics extract midi hits for each drum hit across the whole song the whole album whatever every kit piece manually check that they're perfectly aligned to every transient and then use that to either add samples or uh as a side chain for a gate so that we have perfectly clean drums without any mistakes any false triggers or anything like that it's a whole level of little techniques and little tricks that just a lot of times you don't see anywhere else mm -hmm. um, and it I, just wouldn't be applicable. 
Yeah, I want to elaborate on that for because I don't know who is specifically going to be listening to the podcast, so I'll I'll keep it at like a thirty thousand. Yeah. But but keep explaining how you are. But I'll I'll just elaborate on what he's talking about. So he's taking MIDI, which can be uh, classified as the sheet music, and he's looking at every single specific note. And that's for every single instrument, every single time. And this is with metal music. So it's like, like matching up every single one of those notes and making sure that the actual acoustic one matches up and it's on the grid. So he can quote unquote, like mathematically look at, well, did that hit at the specific time where it needs to? And then did we miss it? And all that kind of stuff. I hopefully explain that well, but the concept of that and the implication of it, like the actual doing it is probably so time consuming. Yeah. It, it, like, again, I, I kind of made a niche for myself in this and that I've been doing it for so long that I can get through one of these tracks in a decent amount of time compared mm-hmm. to what it might take someone who is new to this process. Because uh, a lot of times these sort of busy work tasks are what interns and, and the assistants get assigned to. Um, and it's already at a pretty high level um of of technical ability can you give an example so i what i want to get towards is why it takes more because let, let's say somebody missed a beat and then it extended over into the next measure and then you don't have enough space to fill a specific like so they hit the kick and then um they missed a spot and then they hit the kick again but it happened before and then you don't have enough space to like fill between kicks sure. like there's like such a minutia to making sure you can stretch and squish all of the different hits right yeah it's a lot of times for me it comes down to having uh kind of like rules of thumb that you've generated for yourself over years of practicing these sort of things like i know in, in the case that you're describing if if i have a kick hit and i need to make it longer i could probably extend it by about 20 milliseconds without I know that you know exactly (laughs) what you know like I can I can hit the nudge button three or four times before it it uh starts to sound weird and then if I need to make it sound a little longer then I'll make an extra little cut and then move it another five ten milliseconds and maybe I can get away with that um and if that doesn't work then we've got like elastic audio tricks that where you can actually stretch the audio rather than cutting it up and kind of slicing it into pieces and crossfading it uh, or you can start thinking about, okay, well, the drummer did something similar or exactly the same about a minute ago. So let me go find that and copy paste it in and crossfade it. All these little tricks, it's just like, it's a lot to keep in your mind. So the more you practice it, the more it becomes second nature to, okay, the drummer did this, so I'm going to go fix it this way. Or you have a, a kind of a, a, a triage list of, of ways that you can go about fixing any any given problem like that from my understanding and um my experience the drum kit in general in a recording uh the process of doing the drum kit is like the creme de la creme it's like the it's like you get you get you have a little playground of microphones oh yeah and like all these i don't know if it's worn worn off on you but whenever uh you're doing live bands just looking forward to like, oh, what are we going to do to mic the drum kit? Because yeah. like with a guitar, it's like, let's put a 57 in front of the ca- the cab or with the bass. So it's going to go DI or like a horns or all those other things. It's like maybe just like two mics, three mics. But when it comes to drums, man, yeah. when it comes to drums, it's like it's so exciting because there's so much to, that goes into it. How I'm assuming that you haven't lost oh, yeah. that. No, I think that's that's the same thing. That's that's why I, I love drums and 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 vocals too to an extent. Is is like um, when you get into layering 16, 32, 64 vocal tracks in a in a song, things get much more interesting uh, mm-hmm. than when you just have one lead vocal. Uh, but yeah, with drums, I mean, you're already starting out with. You know, in my case, uh, it's usually between 20 and 30 mics um, right off the bat. And then on on top of that, I'm going to layer in samples. And so, you know, and I'll I'll comp it down to something reasonable later. (laughs) (laughs) But at some point, it's going to be like, I don't know, 50, 60 plus tracks of drums all kind of feeding into each other. The most fun part really is is mixing them once once you've got them recorded well take the audience through a typical drum session recording so for drums i want to have as good sounding uh instrumental tracks uh, aside from the drums as possible and 
hopefully some sort of reference as to what the drums are supposed to be doing. So so you actually have the instrumentals in place before you record the rhythm? Hopefully. I mean, I, I don't want to track drums to an out-of-time guitar. Like, it, if, if the you know guitarist played some demo on his iPhone or whatever... Um, you're like, go re-record that and then come back to me. <laughs> not, not even that. Like, I'll, I'll sit here and record it with him for 30 minutes. Like, I, and if he wants to do it himself and it's, it sounds fine, then that's fine. But I don't want to record drums to sloppy anything. And the, the other part, I, I, I think as I've moved farther in my production career, one of the things that makes recording drums more fun is already having some of the bells and whistles in the production already. For example, like layering in uh, tambourines and shakers and uh, sub drops and all these little I love percussion the term sub drop, <laughs> just in anything to kind of like all all the little good little extra stuff that you would normally throw on in the at the end in like mix notes stage or as an afterthought or as like the extra producer sauce. I want to get that for the drummer to perform to so that he doesn't feel like he has to be as busy. And I don't feel like he has to be as busy. Wow, yeah. Because I'm, I tend to over complicate everything, and that's one of the ways that I've I've found to kind of keep more big picture vibe. Especially going into a drum session, there's so many variables going on. There's so many mics to keep track of. There's there's so many preamps you got to make sure are not clipping. Uh, you got to make sure that the mics aren't moving around. You got to make sure the drums stay in tune. All this kind of stuff. There's a lot that can go wrong, so just try and make it easier on yourself. At least I don't have to be a super producer on top of being a super engineer mm -hmm. all at the same time. So you're, basically you're saying get as many tracks out of the way before drums are tracked. Yeah, I think I, the, d the default of tracking drums first can be a hindrance if you're trying to decide, like, what is the perfect fill for this one part? It's like, well, we have no idea because we don't know what the vocals are doing. We don't know what the guitars <laughs> are doing. It's like, that that fill sounds cool. Sure, why not? But then you're building the rest of the song around whatever that the drummer did. So I feel like this is a much easier way to, to have a big picture view on what is the right thing to do rather than just what sounds cool and just throw every throw every trick you have at the book, throw, let the drummer play as fast as he can. It's much more just like, okay, let's keep this under control. That's great. We'll use that as in the outtakes, and, <laughs> you know, the Instagram videos, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, you're speaking from experience, it sounds like. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I like to overcomplicate things. And then sometimes I go back and I'm like, eh, I probably didn't need to go that hard on it. <laughs> the actual day of recording, how does that look? So um, I try to set up as, as much as possible without the drummer there, uh, it, especially in my case where I have a house kit set up and it sounds pretty good. Uh, and a lot of times the drummer isn't bringing kit. Maybe they'll bring a snare um, or their own cymbals. Um, and if they bring a full kit, we'll definitely check it out and, and put new heads on it and tune it up and make sure like we're checking all available options. My goal usually is to have the kit set up to a point where everything is already turned on, the preamps are already set, the levels are checked, and the drummer can just sit down and start recording. All the kind of technical stuff is already taken That's care of. That's not a small task. No, it isn't. And it usually takes about a day or a half a day uh, to, to get that done, especially if I don't have anybody helping me. Cause it's like, I come in here, hit record, then run into the room and go look at go play and then come back in here and check and see if anything clipped and then listen to it. Be like, okay, that floor Tom doesn't sound that great. Let's go back and retune that again or whatever. Or the snare head sounds dead. I need to change it. Um, that's another thing. I think, uh, some of the, the metal stuff goes a little more OCD with is like, new strings, new drum heads, <laughs> new, new everything. Like everything's got to be like perfect and pristine. There's no, if you want to actually use the tracks that you recorded and not just end up replacing them with samples or end up auto tuning everything later or whatever, you really have to take the time to make sure that everything is perfect and, and drums, the complexity is exponential. So, you know, it, it just takes that much more attention and attention to detail. I, ideally, I just want to, bring the drummer in, have a listen to the song, have a listen to the pre-pro, um, go over any parts that they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what, what we're supposed to be doing here. And maybe, uh, just kind of come up with a rough game plan of how we're going to attack the song. Sometimes I'll just 
you know, depending on how prepared they are, maybe they come in and just play through the song. Uh, maybe they have no idea what the song sounds like and we're going to go section by section and I'll just have them play the intro and maybe the first verse and then we'll go back and say, okay, first verse into the next chorus, chorus into the next part. That's actually more common. Uh, start off with some longer takes, just let them jam, start feeling comfortable on the kit. I'll start to kind of t let my ear absorb what's sounding good and what's sounding bad and try and, um, if I have any of my own demo-itis going on of like, <laughs> if I've listened to the, the program drums too much and it's like, all I hear is that right crash on the chorus and I can't unhear it, um, you know, I've got to evaluate to myself, is that demo-itis or does it really need to be a right Can crash? Can you evaluate on, the... on what demo-itis is? Because okay. I, lo I love that, yes. you, that. Is that a term that you coined? Cause I... Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, I thought it was common knowledge. But um, demo-itis is where you listen to your demo recording or whatever recording it is over and over and over and then you go to redo it and nothing works because it's not like the original mm -hmm. and you're trying to make it better but it never sounds as it, good as it the never original. sounds quite as good or you think it sounds good and then you go back and you listen to the original and like no just <laughs> not quite there it's usually a bad thing and it's usually overcome by one is having a strong producer voice in the room who says, no, that, that, that's not what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it this other way and you're, you're going to get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, just trust me and <laughs> yeah. you know, give, it, give it a day. Sleep on it. And, and if you really hate it tomorrow, then, then we'll change it. And usually that's enough. I guess the other part is just having musicians that are willing to come in knowing that, yes, I've been listening to it this way and I know some things are going to change and I trust you. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's been a great kind of uh the occasions where that's happened to me where where a singer or a drummer particularly a singer uh is what i'm thinking of is when singers really put full trust in you to produce them that's something special let me ask this can you explain the interaction between engineer drummer is in drum room Band members are in here. What is the atmosphere like and how how does creativity manifest itself? I, I try to keep everybody kind of on the same page. Like it's not like the drummer plays something and then I discuss it with the band and be like, guys, what should we tell them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a very hands on producer. I know some people are very, much more just straight engineer i'm just going to record you and and that's that's what i'm good at i don't feel com i don't feel confident enough in my own musical tastes to direct you basically mm -hmm. um whereas i i feel at least in the more aggressive genres that i've worked in for a while now i feel that confidence of being able to say i'm like 90 percent sure that that's not going to work or, <laughs> <laughs> or like you know it's it'll be better just trust me if we do it this way yeah. um and, and a lot of times at this point in my career, a lot of the, the people that on the projects that I'm directly in control with are less experienced than people I may have worked with in more of an assisting context. So I've seen both levels of like, these are the guys who've been doing it for 20 years and know exactly what's expected of them. And they're super pro at it. And then these are the guys that I'm kind of bringing into the studio for the first time and showing them the ropes. Um, and showing them how these top tier productions are done. Mm -hmm. um, so they may be, you know, not used to doing a bunch of takes of drums or going section by section or having like, the most common one is just ha having a drummer like realize that I'm punching you in here. So you have to play the part before it. So that <laughs> the bleed matches like, yeah, some people just can't get that through their heads uh, mm -hmm. Or just just the the ability to split songs up into sections and think about them in in shorter segments and really focus and play the same thing, be able to replicate your performance over and over and make small tweaks to it. That's a different skill that you know I, I kind of take for granted sometimes. Um, and you have to get people accustomed to that workflow or fake it in some way or another. Like you have to be on point enough to realize, okay, that's the take that I need to be able to fix this problem that I'm having. He's never going to play it the way I want it him to. So let me just, I need that. I need that. I need that. And I can cop it together. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll, we'll spend like an hour or so tracking drum parts. And then I'll have the drummer come in here. Cause I, I've noticed, um, and I, I've read this a lot 
from from other people too of, of the importance of headphone mixes I, I think everybody will probably stress the same thing it's just like if the artist whether it's a singer or guitarist or whatever they really need to be able to feel comfortable in what they hear getting a good drum headphone mix is really hard um what do you so are you talking about what they're hearing while they're playing it or yeah. are, are, is it after the fact like hearing it in headphones what they're hearing when they're playing it mm -hmm. uh their monitor mix. yeah, yeah. trying to get it to so that they can actually hear the click they can hear what they're playing and it doesn't sound bad when i hit play and they're listening to it back through the headphones to see oh, if so, the so take all encompassing okay. yeah so usually it's like they'll, they'll play for a little while and then be like i don't know what i just did I don't know if that's any good. So I'll have them come in here or listen to it. And then that kind of, it sounds way better in here. And then they'll be like, okay, that's great. Let's go do the next part. So it's usually take about two or three hours to track a song drums. And then I like to go back and edit it as soon as possible. Um, like same day? If possible. Um, really? I, I feel like my ears and my energy would be so fatigued at, at that point. But yeah, Sometimes, sometimes I'll just comp it and then leave the edits for the next day. But at the same time, I'm usually so excited to be like, yes, we did, we got, we did the thing. Mm -hmm. We got the drum recording done. I, I want to hear the final result as quickly as possible. And okay. that, that's what gives me that satisfaction of I did the job. Yeah, it's like yeah, having sure. the half edited thing. It's like it's there, but I can't really show it to anybody because it doesn't sound good enough. It's mm -hmm. like, let me just get it done. And uh, while I'm like excited about it and yeah. Um, if I can manage it, if my brain is totally shot, then yeah, I'll leave it for the next day. And, mm -hmm. but at least going through the comps and, and making sure I've got the right takes. Cause I definitely don't want to do that any other day than the day of tracking. And are they still here while you're putting together comps? And by, by comps, do you mean, again, I'm just trying to keep it for yeah. other people, uh, by comps, you mean like, these are the best sections of the parts of the songs that I believe these are the takes for each right. section. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Okay. And and usually I try to do that on the fly because I, I really don't like going back and listening to eight tracks of the or that eight takes of the same thing and trying to pick which one sounds the best. It's just like, yeah, no, that's the one. If we need to change a snare hit here or there, that's fine. And then and going back and editing time consideration really just depends on the complexity of the song. Um, like I can kind of I'll know whether it's going to take me an hour to edit or three hours or four hours. Mm -hmm. um, it usually comes down to how how much kick there is. Which kind of <laughs> goes back to the whole kick pad thing that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Do you, let's go ahead and dive into that. So while we were uh, taking a tour before we started recording here, he showed me his drum kit. And there is one big piece of equipment, drum drum equipment, that is not as big uh, <laughs> a part of the set that's there. It, it's the kick drum. The kick drum is just a pad. Uh, yeah. go, go ahead and explain to the audience what that is. Yeah, and it's a it's just the rolling kick pad that you would find on like their e drum kits. Um, well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying the last couple projects that I've recorded, we used a real kick drum because they weren't super intensive on uh, on the kick parts. But I'd say at least 75, 80 percent of the records that I've worked on in the last eight years have been using this Roland kick pad, uh, which is just the the thing that you would find on a Roland E drum kit. Mm -hmm. um, and all it does is send a little tick out through an audio cable, and then you use that to trigger the actual sound of the kick drum. So it doesn't actually sound like a kick drum. It's just it's the same thing as if you were hitting a uh, like little red triggers that they used to see on drums and they would send a signal out to a trigger module and that's how Def Leppard sounds like Def Leppard. Mm -hmm. um, Is that happening live while you're recording or while you're recording, do you just hear the the little click? No, I, I run it into a track and it's running an insert that triggers uh, the sound, the, the kick sound. Is it digital live. or is that an out of board gear thing? No, it's... A, um, I, I use a plugin for it. Some people use a like an, an old like Alesis module just because the latency might be a that's, little bit that's less. That's what I was getting at. I would just feel like if you're recording, especially with all the tracks that you're doing at the same time, right? I feel like latency could become an issue there. Yeah, I, it's it's constantly a fight of trying to set up the session in a way where I can get the most um, out of my drum tracks and hear it as close to the final product while still being able to track at a decently low latency. Yeah. So obviously with the 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 non-drum stuff, I'm like bouncing down to stereo stems. So mm -hmm. there's no CPU going on there. 
And I guess some of the output routing is going to take up some CPU, like it's, it's going out to headphone amps so that the d drummer can create his own um, mix. But, but, all, but, but all in all, what the drummer is hearing when he hits that kick is an actual kick sound. Yeah, it's an actual so. kick sound. It may, it's probably like five milliseconds late from, from what he's playing, but uh, it, it's not annoying compared to what an actual kick would be. I mean, using a... Well, like, my, my audio interface is USB, so it's not like the lowest latency that I could possibly get out of the fanciest audio interface. Mm -hmm. With this setup, it's about equal. Like if I do it with or without the kick pad, the, the latency is about the same. Go ahead and explain why you use the kick pad. Yeah. Though. So one of the defining attributes of, of metal songs is you hear this constant kick, just go <laughs> straight 16th throughout or whatever. Um, and it sounds like a typewriter. Every hit is exactly the same volume. Um, and there's no dynamics to it usually, and it's super fast. And so when you're editing a drum kit, you have to edit all of the tracks together generally because you want to maintain the phase coherency in scientific terms between the mics. But really, it's just like if you have a bunch of mics recording one thing, you can't pull them all apart time-wise. And the, the process of editing drums is moving things in time to get them to sound more consistent to the grid yeah so what he's explaining here you can't just take the snare microphone and replace the snare microphone track because all of the other microphones are picking up the snare when it's hit so if you were to play back a track it would sound really weird to hear in like just a snare hit that wasn't acoustically recorded by the rest of the mics. so what he's talking about is if you mess up on one hit any of the instruments it affects every single part of the drum kit. Right. And I guess one of the basic kind of examples of ways that this kick pad kind of setup can be useful is if you have a drummer who can't seem to hit the crash and the kick at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's like noticeable. If like they're hitting it late or they're hitting it early, um, that's hard to fix because you can't move those two elements uh independently without creating some some major problems um so with the kick pad basically what it does is it isolates it it's not totally silent but it's it's silent enough that all the other drums and cymbals are going to drown it out uh in in mics so you can edit the kick separately so rather than let's say you're playing a 4-4 beat and you're you're riding on your crash cymbal and the kick is doing 16th notes that's every time you hit the crash you're going to have to have four little edits for each of those kicks. So if you if you can edit the kick in isolation, then you don't have to make those cuts on the cymbals and your cymbals sound in theory four times less edited or you know, you can put it that way, I guess. Not not only that, but it's efficiency like time time right. time wise you're only having to make one edit versus four. Right. And in the grand scheme of things when you're when you're making thousands of edits per song or hundreds of edits, uh that adds up very fast. Uh, you're also like when you're when you're cutting up a performance, it's just less hits to look at. Yeah, like like you said, it's uh, you only have to focus on snare, toms, and cymbals. It's just less tracks that you're looking at. I think in general, any any way that you could simplify things down and just let your mind, f you know, it, it, the, the whole thing of of not trying to multitask too much. Um, any way any way that you can simplify these things down into uh, uh check boxes or or you know procedures that you go through every time that are consistent or relatively consistent and that you have confidence in so that you can kind of do it with half your brain turned off you don't have to be 100 percent every single day because it's not going to happen that's one of the tricks that really helps just the overall sound quality of the audio tracks is so much better generally 10 years ago most metal productions were using 100 percent replaced sample replaced kick snare toms maybe or that's crazy or maybe like 50 percent on the so snare, they would play 50%. it acoustically just to turn it into right. machinically it's, it's basically <laughs> like yeah you set up 20 mics to record this drum kit and then you end up using the overheads and a bunch of drum samples and that was kind of the norm wow wow so it's, it's all these tricks that we kind of built up to be able to get it to a point where it's not like that or you can actually use the sounds that you were you spent so much time recording. It's like, why spend all day tuning the drums up if they're just going to be replaced with samples? Um, it's, it's stupid.
Mm -hmm. And and ten years ago, there were, you know people were spending big budgets going into these fancy studios just to have their stuff replaced in post. And it's it's <laughs> it's dumb. And so that's that's kind of the, the niche that I got into was working with producers who actually knew how to work with natural drums in a metal context and make them sound good. And that's I've kind of been working incrementally to just further that, keep furthering that because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not big trade secrets or anything like I and I don't I don't like having big trade secrets either. It's like I. I would rather like I get excited about these techniques and stuff and I want to tell people about it mm -hmm. and and just get on and learn the next new thing that's going to make me excited about production. Mm -hmm. Um it's not like I I want to be like I can't tell anybody about this plugin. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I won't work anymore. Um <laughs> No. Nah. You have to work 10 years underneath me to get right. know this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, it's like I get excited, I tell the people that I'm working under about a cool thing that I found out and they get excited mm -hmm. and you know, that, that places more trust in, in me and you know, so, you know, yeah, it's a two way street. Can you give a brief five minute overview of how you got to this point? Sure. I started interning at Doppler studios and 2011 as at Javier trained me. <laughs> um, you trust me, you're way beyond me in, in all things audio. <laughs> Well, it trains me to to be a, an employee, and <laughs> that's actually a good. Just talking about the concept of uh, interaction, because it's like you in any. I think I can't blanket statement for all fields, but I think the technical aspect of anything, whether you're like a rocket scientist or anything, like people can learn that. But it's just the interaction and the actual what you were talking about having the presence of. Uh, if you are the producer, if you have the right voice to be like, and you know that, hey, we need to stop doing this because we're wasting time and we want to do it this way or to get to certain tracks. It's like that's the kind of stuff that you can't really teach. Yeah. We saw enough interns coming in and out of the studio that uh, it was pretty clear when people got along with clients and, and who who is good at that sort of interaction and uh, who wasn't going to last in, in that sort of way. Just to briefly touch on it, what we're kind of getting at is at Doppler during the day, it's very much a, it's a studio that records like ADR or um, audio dialogue replacement. I don't even think that's the right acronym, but the um, it's like for movies and commercials and things like that. But then during the night is very much cliche what you would think a hip hop uh, recording is going on. And sometimes... Uh, there were some rock acts as well. Uh, Occasionally, yeah, you got lucky with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Walk the Moon, Walk the Moon was there. While you're there, you're just like a liaison between the machines, the building, and like just making sure all the things work for the people that are coming in and out. Um, and I, I think it teaches you a lot just to being in the room, just being a fly in the wall, and then also just interacting with or a lack of interacting and just like soaking up all the stuff from all the people that come through there because it's like legit people walk or that were coming yeah. through there yeah i mean that was i guess probably rule number one aside from just don't break anything would be like, <laughs> don't be a fanboy don't be awkward don't be you know don't be that guy who runs up on the celebrity as they walk in the door and be like dude <laughs> Um, <laughs> going on from there, where what else have you been doing? In uh, how like because obviously even while you were there, you were doing metal stuff, right? right? Well, it was it was kind of almost at the same time as I started interning at Doppler. Um, I was in a band with a guy. His older brother was in a band. The band ended. He moved to Orlando to join another established metal studio as an engineer. And I just threw it out there that I had been editing drums for a couple local bands and just like I, I was kind of fascinated with the idea of editing drums and, and just how much that affected your perception of the quality of the performance. Like mm -hmm. especially with uh, metal. Yeah. Or even even just like I vividly remember the first time like in my bedroom in like 2004 having a Digi 002 and having four mics. Like two overheads, kick snare, and recording my basic little setup, mm -hmm. and then quantizing it using 
beat detective and be like, oh, <laughs> that's how they get there. And then like using sound replacer and layering some samples and being like, oh, OK, so that's how you make a record um, or how, that's, how you, that's how you make it sound like that. You know, it's like I can get guitars pretty close. I can get bass pretty close. <laughs> you just sounded like plugging in like so Digi02 at this point is kind of some people could razz me for this, but it's, it's like an eight track of like the old school oh, day. Yeah. It, but, nothing sounded good through it. <laughs> yeah, but the equivalent of if you were to get out a tape recorder in in terms of interfaces, but everybody knows what a Digio 2 is. Yeah, and it was it was a lot of people's introduction to Pro Tools. It was that kind of point where Pro Tools became like a thing that other people had outside of outside of major recording studios and you could actually start to break into that world and get some experience that way. But the way you explain it was almost like it was like your cocaine hit of like where, oh, you're, at, where you're at today. It's like like your first time drumming and then being able to do what the quote unquote pros are doing and then yeah. just being like demystifying the process. Right. Because I, I had even used uh, a Digi 001 before that, which only had two inputs. And so when we tried to record drums, we were subbing, submixing it through a mixer and just like getting stereo channels and nothing you could do with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just totally clueless at that point. Like I was afraid to use any inserts other than reverb because I just didn't know like how that worked. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All these threshold knee (laughs) ratio. I don't know what that means. (laughs) Reverb. I know what that does. (laughs) Wet, dry. I could do that. Uh, Yeah. Um, and awesome. But yeah. And, And I had the same struggle with vocals for a long time of like, I'm recording myself. I'm like, you know, I, I sit here in front of my SM7, like belting my heart out and doing the best that I can. I'm like, I think I'm an okay singer. Why does this not sound like the record? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're using the same exact microphone well, and all that e- stuff. Even you know? if I'm not, it's like, I should be able to get close. Mm-hmm. Like what, what's the secret there? The first time that I pulled up, a, there's this plugin called, uh, Vox former by Voxingo. There was a VST long time ago. I think it still exists, but it had a preset that, preset that just had so much EQ and so much compression and so much like limiting and reverb and everything else. And it just right off the bat, I was like, that sounds 10 times better than anything I've ever recorded just because <laughs> of how much compression and like mm-hmm. how drastic the moves You put are. it into the black box and then it right. kicked out like this amazing thing. So that was, once I figured that out, I was like, okay, now it's time to reverse engineer that and figure out what the black box is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, I, I, I kind of take the same approach to a lot of things of just like, that sounds amazing. Let me see if I can reproduce it. Uh, using whatever tools I have, whatever research I can find out about the subject. Um, quantizing drums is one thing, and hearing hearing your drummer played back and having it sound good, that's 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 a pretty major step. I think the next major step for me on drums was being able to mix a drum set to the point where I could A-B it with uh, a commercial recording and actually feel okay about it. Mm-hmm. Um and that was another huge... Just, How long did it take to get to that point? Gosh. I, I think I probably maybe hit that point late 2017, maybe. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I started referencing other mixes uh, in, in particular ways. And not just like once I'm getting towards the end of the mix, kind of like, let me put this on for... Let me put this Radiohead track on for 10 seconds and see, like, does it even come close or not? Mm-hmm. And the answer is always no. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> It's like, unless unless you're just born with golden ears, if you wait that long in the process to check your check your work, you're going to be off. <laughs> uh, That's a great piece of advice. I think so. Like, there there's certainly something to be said for having uh, total just like whatever comes out, comes out. And that's that's what my ears were hearing at the time. And that's how it, it, it should sound, because that's what I wanted it to sound in the like in the moment. That's. Sure, that's I think artistic integrity at its fiercest. If you want to be able to put out mixes that consistently sound competitive to to whatever else is being put out there, you can't just wing it. Um, productions, whatever you 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 have to like have some sort of baseline quality reference. And I know people who have been been using the same reference mix for over ten years. How does that how does that manifest itself during a recording process? Like, mm. are you are you somebody get on snare? They hit the snare. You play reference recording. 
Like, is it something like that or to, it can be, I've, I've gone to that point where it's like, let's see how close we can get just with the, with as little as possible. Like let's pull up a snare mic and, you know, using one EQ, let's see if we can get close to the album tone. I have, I have tricks with like visualizers, uh, uh, like frequency analyzers where I kind of know, like I've looked at enough frequency plots of drums that I know like no what it should joke. look like. This is how you know John's like super <laughs> profesh when it comes to this kind of stuff. I don't, I don't even mix with my ears anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's just looking at charts. But the, like the, the fact that you're referencing and you're playing back, do you just like cut out the drum, like a drum solo and like, just like look at, that's, that's not a bad way to do it. Or, or like guitar intros is, is the, probably the, the mo- most common one is like, if I could find, cause everybody's got the, the one guitar intro riff on mm-hmm. some song on their record. Yeah. You can isolate that and have the guitarist play a riff and then a B. Oh no. I was talking about drums specifically though. Oh yeah. Um, it's a little more rare to go that extreme with drums. It's, it's usually more after I've recorded the drums and I'm, I'm starting to put okay. the mix on them. I love how you say it like a rap reference. Like let's, let's put the mix on them. <laughs> <laughs> it dropped. Yeah. <laughs> John Douglas. Drop the subs. Da, 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 drop the mix. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, when, when I'm recording drums, I want it to sound as good as possible, but there's obviously limitations with latency and, and CPU and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just got to get it listenable uh, for for the session. And and then I really dig into like, what is my target mix? Or like, what what do I, if I can beat this mix or, or yeah, it's really like, let me pick a mix that I think I want to beat. And, and that's, that's awesome. That's where I go from there is usually I'm not soloing out drums. I'm like, let me isolate their snare and compare it. It's usually more like, let me get everything kind of where the levels are relatively similar to the reference mix and then listen and be like, okay, is their snare brighter is, or is they have wow. more like, do they have more a hundred Hertz kind of stuff? And especially with the, the analyzers, you can get really, really nerdy with that kind of stuff. Like if you, if you get your balances, uh, similar to a reference mix, and then you have your overall volume similar to a reference mix. You can just run a match EQ on it and tell you like, okay, compared to that mix, you've got too much 2K and you've got too much 150. You just, you know, and then you say, okay, well, most of my 2K is probably coming from my rhythm guitar, so let's go find 2K. That then, is crazy. You know, it's it's that's my way of working is much more of like a scientific. Mm-hmm. Like, cause that's the only way I can feel confident about these sort of decisions and make them quickly too. And, and not be like, let me suck six DB out of two K. Yeah, it might be okay. Let's try, <laughs> let's try this other frequency and see if that sounds better. I don't know. They both sound okay to me. I was like, no, there's, you know, a B, which one sounds closer? A. Okay. Moving on. You know? Wow. Um, what a time to be alive. Right. <laughs> It took me a long time to to get to that point of of not just stabbing in the dark because a lot of times I feel like I would do what a lot of people I'm sure are doing at this moment and like going on YouTube and watching you know some some guy pulls up his Pro Tools session and you look at his EQ and he's like oh he's boosting 10 dB at this mm-hmm. and so I'm gonna do that <laughs> I was like well but he's got totally different source recordings than you do I, I've done a lot of work with. Um, this URM Academy. And, and one of the things that they offer is they will get bands to release their raw stems from, from songs and then have the producer come on and mix the, those raw stems and show you how they did it. And then there'll be like a mix competition to see. So that's like one way it's like a, a, a legit way of, of kind of comparing yourself one-to-one to a record with the same source material. Um, and that's, that's a resource that, really just wasn't available 10 years ago like mm-hmm. to be able to get the actual stems from your favorite band's song and see what the bar actually is like that's like when i when i can pull open like the lead vocal track from my favorite band with no effects on it or anything and, and compare it to my lead vocal track with nothing on it and see just like see how close i am that's scientific that's what i need to be able mm-hmm. to to have confidence in what i'm doing Going back to Doppler, um, and especially with uh, Walk the Moon when they were in the studio, when uh, Nick, do you remember his last name? 
It was Nick, uh, and then the producer? Ben and Ben Allen. Nick, uh, I didn't meet him. Uh, but, so it's Ben Allen was a producer, and then Nick was the recording engineer. And I'm sorry, I don't have your last name. Uh, but when they mic'd up the drums, and then they just the guy hit the snare drum, and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> like, <laughs> this just sounds like Smashing Pumpkins. Like, uh, d- d- no, no effects, nothing. That was just like straight, like. Just microphone placement, just how how he treated his drums and the mics and, and like that was straight out of the microphone. And then I was like, what the hell do you do after that? Like, yeah. what? Like you if this is how it sounds right now, how, like what? <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. But again, that's what the professional like. That was one of those eye opening moments where it's like, this is why X engineer gets paid X amount of money because. They go in there and they do the things and they have the stuff and then boom, it's like fuck, <laughs> like yeah. this is so cool. Yeah, as, as long as you get to that end result where where people can hear it and have it sound awesome like that, um, and yeah, the the amount like going back to just the amount of variables involved in drum recording to make a drum sound like that through one mic is is kind of nuts, and that's a specialty in and of itself. Um, even I'm sure just he like, had like the other mics on, but I just remember when they started first tuning, like they were just like, well, let's go and see what it happens. Right. Like, just go ahead and give me some snare. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Like yeah. crazy. The the difference between a well-tuned drum set and a drum set that's been sitting around <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. is incredible too. Yeah. Like, and, and new heads versus old heads and all that kind of stuff. Like I've spent the last year or so trying to get better at that kind of stuff. Um, and and even so, I've really only touched on like a certain like style of drum tuning of like these are the intervals between the top and bottom heads. I'm using this style of head. I'm I'm tuning generally to this tuning range, especially with the snare. It's like, you know, you have the guys who tune it super loose and, and they get that huge 80s thud thing where I have no experience tuning drums like that, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty good at getting like the ringy like bell brass kind of like just bang can i just explain the the one of the things i love about video editing is it's visual and you can you can you you do the edit like there's no black box thing well for special effects or whatever like like you do the edit and it's there when you have to describe audio sound effects without playing them (laughs) it takes a whole nother talent it's like say you're tuning the drums and then you're like well i didn't i got the ding but it was just a little middle second too much ing let's take off some of that ing (laughs) a little more a little more douche and a little more a little less ding you gotta have yeah and then yeah when you're communicating with drummers over the the talk back that's a whole nother thing it's like what syllable do you use for snare and what syllable (laughs) No, do do ka do do ka do do cuts. Yeah, as in like playing back stuff. That's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, let, let's let's start to wrap it up. Uh, one of the questions I always ask everybody at the end of the podcast is, "Why do you do what you do?" Yeah, that you know, I don't. It's a question that I haven't framed to myself quite in that in that way. I I almost think about it in the reverse of like, what the hell would I do if I wasn't doing this? <laughs> And I honestly don't know, um, you know, like from a very early age, I had, I had a passion in, in computers and, and music. And, and for as long as I can remember, that was pretty much it. There was, there was a, there's a sports period as most young boys have, mm-hmm. but, um, computers and music have been, have been the consistent thing. And, and this is kind of the marriage. This is like the perfect marriage of those two things for me. Um, especially given that I get to work on a style of music that I actually like. And it's not just, yeah, I'm working on music and I'm in the studio, but like I could care less about the kind of stuff that I'm putting out. It's like, no, I'm passionate about the stuff that I'm working on and I'm, I get to do it in an environment. Yeah, this is my house. This is my home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I can't really, it's like, for me, that's why I think it's like, what would I do if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't have all this, it's like, this is kind of like what I've been, you know, I, I have to, I have to think about like what's what's next. Like what? How could it get any better? Like mm-hmm. what's uh, what's what's the next forty years of my life gonna be about? Um, cause yeah, 
the first 30 or so have been all about music and technology and learning all the ins and outs and just kind of trying to soak as much of it in so I can be the guy who is the expert at that, you know? Um, and that's, that's what really gives me a, a sense of satisfaction at the end of the day is when I can play something back or show, you know, play, play a mix for somebody. And they're like, damn, that sounds amazing. That sounds better than anything I've heard. I, I need you on my project or whatever. I'm assuming it's the same effect that I had with um, Ben Allen and Nick in the in the studio when they went and hit the snare drum. Right. Like when a band comes in and then they they hear the first like when you have everything tuned, it's like, oh, we're making a metal record. Right. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like another Doppler reference. The first time I saw Sean Coleman edit, like doing audio edits for Squidbillies, yeah. I was like. Uh, I got to get faster at Pro Tools. Smoke coming up. From the sk- <laughs> so I did a I did an interview with him, and you know he like he doesn't really edit on Pro Tools anymore. Really? So he he still produces music and does stuff with that, but he has a mixing board. Oh, and the- he does everything like mixing wise on it. And I was like, wait, what? And I guess for his new job where he's at, it took him like two to three months of just being the slowest I bet. audio engineer but obviously he has the theoretical background to to implement the things I'm, i have to see that such, in person such such tangential thing but just know that sean coleman is hands down the fastest editor i've ever seen in my life i, I wouldn't be surprised in 10 years if you see a whole lot more people working on those touch screens yeah, you know yeah. i i'm i was i'm still very skeptical of it but the fact that he's using one makes me Fifty mm-hmm. percent less skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> that that gives you the gusto of the person that we're talking about. If you're listening, yeah. Sean, love you, big up, man. Uh, and then the next question that I ask everybody is: Let's say it's from high school onward. What would you tell people to get to the point where you're at today? Advice. Right. Well, um, if they want to pursue what you're doing right now, yeah. For for what I and I get that question a fair amount because I I was doing these like um skype kind of one-on-one advice type things for a while and a lot of it was with people who are are seeking to get to the same point and i feel like there's two roads that generally get recommended and one of them is be a very social person go out to shows meet a lot of people network your ass off and let them know that this is what you do and just be a nice guy help out with everything the other is the road I've taken, <laughs> which is just be uh, super obsessed with what you do and get really, really good at it and um, get lucky in a few ways of meeting the right people at the right times and and putting yourself out there to the right people, I guess. Um, like find out who it is who's doing the thing that you want to be doing right now and figure out how to work for them. And then from there, you if you can gain their trust, then you will gain the clients that they can't take on in the future or whatever that, you know, the runoff from that. Um, and that's that's really how I've built up my my stuff is is taking on it, it's been a slow build up and it's been slower than a lot of people that I've seen take the opposite route of just being extremely proactive and going out there hard on social media and going to shows all the time. For me, that's just not my style. Um and I got lucky in a few cases. Uh, it, people say, yeah, it's not lucky. You, you, you know, you had the right skills at the right time with the right people. But I think uh, if, you, if, you have, if you have that goal of, I want to be the guy that does that, um, find out who's doing that now or the closest thing and, and see what you can learn from them and, and see if you can be their apprentice. Because I, th- I st- still feel like that the apprentice model, you know, it's certainly not as prevalent as it as it once was, but um, it's hard to replace that style of learning, especially in in creative and yeah, this combination of creative and technical um, art yeah. forms. Yeah, know? I would say audio engineering uh, in general. The mentorship, I, in my opinion, would f- far outweigh a collegiate degree. Oh yeah. If you're serious about it now, it's hard, like, cause obviously you made the right decision. Like, obviously you st- you're still passionate about it, but there's like, there's a, that's a hard decision there where it's like, do you give up doing, cause there, I mean, there's so much argument that's still there for the, well, you need to go get a degree and all that kind sure. of stuff. And <clears throat> I think hands down, if you are serious about being an audio engineer, 
and you think 10 years down the line, you still want to be an audio engineer, mentorship is far superior. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it may vary from, th- uh, from like different genre to different genre, but from my experience seeing different things play out, you just, you learn so much faster in the place where you want to be. You're, you're doing the things, right. you know? Yeah, there, there's no, there's no substitute for that kind of experience. Like I can watch all the tutorials, uh, of, of drum editing I want, but I've, I've worked on like over a hundred metal records now and Mm -hmm. it's just like there's there's i know i've been through every conceivable (laughs) situation (laughs) pretty much every once in a while i'm a surprise but (laughs) um yeah there's just no replacement for that and i the other thing i I think is um make sure that it's something that you feel like you can you can yeah you feel like you can continue to be passionate about and continue to want to learn from mm-hmm. it not just hit like a plateau and and be like okay i, I did the thing mm-hmm. um because i i feel like i'm always pushing and and to, to learn the next new trick and i know that there are a lot of like people who would just prefer to stick with the old school what you know whatever they learned in their in their 20s or 30s and mm-hmm. whatever they have that's working now just stick with it but uh you know i i think it, it's important with the rate of new people coming into the field and just, you know, there's, there's it's always, tough. it is so tough. There's people who are passionate. And so you better be passionate too. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no replacement for that. That's, that's the biggest motivation that I have is it's like, you know, sometimes I get tired of doing whatever it is that I'm working on and I go back and sit on the couch for 10 minutes. And then I think about, man, I should really go work on that some more because <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> And if it wasn't awesome to me, then I wouldn't want to work on it. I would just go mm-hmm. find some other way to kill time, go play video games or something. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's like, this is what I need to be doing. This is this is what I care about legitimately. It's not just a job. Yeah. So There you go. There you go. Work and play at the same time. Where can people find you? JohnDouglas.net. Um, you can uh, email me at John at JohnDouglas.net. You can find me on Instagram at John D. Douglas and Facebook at same address. Twitter, same thing. Um, hit me up. We'll have some fun. And from my understanding, it sounds like your specialty in terms of like working with other individuals is drums and specifically in the metal genre. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really open to doing full productions. I, I really, lately, I feel like um, my confidence has grown in taking on the whole process of from from start to completion from songwriting to finished mix um so if that sounds like something you're interested in um here (laughs) (laughs) awesome well thank you so much for your time man thank you javier all right uh if you want to check me out i'm at javier mercedes x that's j-a-v-i-e-r-m-e-r-c-e-d-e-s and then there's an x on the end so there you go If you want to tag me on anything, especially if you would like to share out the podcast that you just heard, that'd be awesome. Uh, Just tag me at Javier Mercedes X and maybe John Douglas at the same time. And then we could chat Uh, till next episode. Live a life of abundance and I'll see you guys on the next one.